This evening's scripture reading will be from the book of Revelation, uh, chapter 21, verses 7 and 8. Revelation 21, verses 7 and 8. I'll be reading from the New American Standard. He who overcomes will inherit these things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But for the cowardly and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and immoral persons and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars, their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Good evening. Good for us to be here again tonight. Hope that uh, you had a good afternoon. I'm glad that we can be here. Uh, just again want to remind you, of course, about the uh, summer series that starts Wednesday. Remember, there are the cards out in the foyer. Let's please get these out. As I said, maybe last Wednesday, uh, we ordered 500 of these. We don't have to get all of rid, rid of all of those this first week. But over the summertime, let's try and make sure that we uh, take advantage of these. A couple of weeks ago, we had our uh, evangelism day and uh, had a lot of good participation and a lot of good feedback. Uh, the reason we are having the meal is not just so that we can eat. Uh, the, the evangelistic reason we are having the meal is because from our experience and probably from yours too, uh, you notice when you have something to invite people to and you're offering them free food, they're more than likely going to gonna come. So uh, you may want to encourage them. Make sure, again, that you pass these out. Just, uh, just you know, people that you know, again, maybe some people that you, you just meet, and invite them to come and to uh, be a part of this, this opportunity. We've got some great speakers, and we've got a, a good topic talking about the kingdom and talking about the, the parables of Jesus, these fundamental truths uh, about the church, about heaven, about what we are looking forward to. Of course, another opportunity is this Friday. We have the uh, Friday night uh, area-wide York County singing. So please make sure that you are here and a part of that. Uh, the, the best thing that could happen to be an encouragement, it would be for us to have a good crowd. Uh, as you know, when there's a small crowd of people, the singing isn't always very good or isn't always quite as good to us uh, in, in our ears. So if you will come and, and bring some folks, uh, please be here at 7 o'clock. There will be some refreshments provided. Uh, so please make sure that you are a part of that. And again, there's another opportunity for you to invite some folks uh, to come and get to know the church a little bit better. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to the book of Revelation. We'll be there tonight for the majority of our lesson. I want you to consider this question. <clears throat> Can you be too afraid to go to heaven? Have you ever thought about that? Too afraid to go to heaven? What, what are you talking about? No, no I, I'm not too afraid to go to heaven. If you read in Revelation chapter 20, let's read verses 11 through 15. Uh, we read a scene, the judgment scene. Uh, that it is going to be like, at least uh, one of the, the, acts, the, the facets of how the judgment will be like. And there are some, perhaps, some, some scenes here that give us a little bit of uh, trepidation, uh, give us a little bit of pause, make, you know, make us ask ourselves, okay, well, am I really ready for uh, that day? Am I really ready for the judgment day? Let's notice what it says in Revelation 20, verses 11 through 15. He says, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat upon it, whose presence, from whose presence, Earth and heaven fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne. And books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books according to their deeds. Now that can be, if it's just according to our deeds, that can be something you can think back to your life and uh, throughout your life, maybe in recent times, probably certainly in, in past times, and you can say, well, I don't know about that. Uh, you know, it's been described this way, and I, I don't think it's, we don't see this in Scripture, and we don't know exactly what it's going to be like, but uh, he says that we're going to be judged according to our deeds. So there are these books, figuratively, in heaven, where your deeds have been recorded. Does that give you a little bit of pause? Does that give you a little bit of trepidation? In some ways, perhaps it does. Uh, per, you know, that, that God and, and, and those in heaven, and, and perhaps on that day, what, what, what's that going to look like? Are they going to stand there and say, all right, Andy Brewster, let me see. On this day, you did this. And I may be like, yeah, I did that. And this day, you no, I don't, don't mention that one. Right? Well, there may be times that, that give us pause. We don't want people to talk about some of the things that we might do. But we're going to be judged according to our deeds. Verse 13, and the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every one of them. Every one of them, according to their deeds. 
Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name, listen to this, and if anyone's name was not found in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. There's this book, the book of life, that your name as a Christian gets recorded into when you become a Christian. And if your name is not found there in in that book on that day, then you don't get to go to heaven. So in some ways we can think about it, am I, am I afraid of the judgment day? There can be a little bit of pause, a little bit of trepidation again, a little bit of fear perhaps. For those of us who are Christians, hopefully our, our faith is strong enough that we recognize that there's no reason for that fear. Scripture tells us elsewhere that perfect love casts out fear, and we, there is no more perfect love than the love that Jesus had to die for us and our obedience to accept His grace uh, through faith, repentance, confession, and baptism. So there doesn't have to be that kind of fear. But when you think about the judgment day, is there a little bit of fear? There probably has been at least at some point in your life. Hopefully maybe not as, quite as much today. Let's go into chapter 21, and let's see the description that we read about here of heaven. Revelation 21, let's read verses 1 through 7, and then we'll skip to verses 9 and 10. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming out, from, um, coming out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will be no longer any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. And he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And he said, Write, for these words are faithful and true. Then he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of water of life without cost. He who overcomes will inherit these things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. Then verse 9 and 10. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came and spoke with me, saying, Come here, and I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the Spirit to a great and high mountain, and showed me the holy city Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God. Here we, We see here what is, in essence... What we can sum up through all of this, there may be some things that we don't know exactly everything that's being referred to here and there. We're going to talk about a couple of things that I've noticed as I was studying for this lesson here in a few minutes. But we can see clearly this is a beautiful picture. For those who are Christians, this is a beautiful picture. For people who have no fear really of the judgment day because, not because of our deeds, we would be scared if we were just judged because of our deeds. But we have hope in Jesus And because of that, we have no fear of the judgment day. We see, in essence, that this is a beautiful picture. But I want to notice two things here. First of all, it talks about the tabernacle. Notice again in verse 3. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. This picture of the tabernacle or the dwelling place of God from the Old Testament. Before the temple was built, when the uh, Israelites had to wander around in the wilderness, you remember that the, the tabernacle was built, this, this tent that was the dwelling place of God, and, the, and the, the, the cloud that was the presence of God would come and dwell upon it. And when the cloud moved, they, they would tear down all of their tents, and they'd move to the next place. And wherever the cloud stopped, that's where they stopped. And if the cloud moved again, they'd tear down all their tents, including the tabernacle, and they'd go to wherever the next spot was. And they did this for how many years? For 40 years they did this, right? And where the presence of God was, where were they? That's where they were. God determined where they would be. And here we see in this picture of judgment, we see in this picture of heaven, that there's this tabernacle. And this tabernacle is where? Where God is. And this tabernacle is not only where God is, but it's where His people are. That's the essence of heaven, isn't it? That we will be with God. In reality, that's the essence of hell, that we will not be with God. But notice and recognize when we think about the, the tabernacle from 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. You can read these verses later, write them down, I encourage you to. 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17 tells us uh, that the temple of God is, you are a part of the temple of God. You individually as a Christian, you are a part of the temple of God. Your body is the, the dwelling place of Christ, the dwelling place of God. And then in Ephesians 
chapter 2, verses 20 through 22, it says that we collectively are the temple of God. Now, in Revelation, it references the tabernacle. In those two verses, it rep represents the, uh, the, the temple. But in essence, what's the job of both of those things? The tabernacle and the temple was where the presence of God dwelt. What does that mean? Today, you as a Christian are where the presence of God dwells. And when it talks about here this tabernacle, in verse 3 where it says, Behold, the tabernacle of God, he's talking about you. When this, this new heaven and new earth, this, this new place comes, and behold, the tabernacle of God, he's talking about where we're going to be in the presence of God. Because the tabernacle is where the presence of God is. We are the temple individually. We are the temple collectively. We will be in the presence of God to the fullest extent imaginable. There's already blessings that you and I have because we're Christians here in this life. But none of them compare with the blessing of being in the pr very presence of God. And we long, of course, for that day. It also says here, uh, talking about uh, the, the bride of Christ. If you go down to uh, verses 9 and 10, talking about one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the last seven plagues. He says, Come here, and I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. Verse 10, And he carried me away in the, in the Spirit to a great and high mountain, and showed me the holy city Jerusalem coming down from a heaven. So here we see, he, the angel says, I'm going to show you the bride of Christ. I'm going to show you uh, the, the bride of the Lamb. And he says, and there's the, the new Jerusalem that's coming. So here the Jerusalem is pictured as the bride of Christ. If we go back to verse 2 of chapter 21, it says, I saw the holy city, new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. So we see Jerusalem here presented as the bride of Christ. Turn over to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, a, a passage you're familiar with, because uh, Ephesians chapter 5 is, is where we go to to talk about husband and wife relationships. Husband, love your wives. Uh, wives, submit to your husband. And, and all the details that we get there. But do you remember the culmination of that conversation? He says, I I'm really not talking to you about husband and wives. I'm talking to you about a mystery, about Jesus and the church, about Jesus and his bride. Notice what it says in verses uh, 25 and 26. Husbands, loves your, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. Verse 26, so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church, well, how? In all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. Revelation chapter 21 and verse 2. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. Who's this bride that's coming and that's beautiful and that's adorned for her husband? It's talked about in Revelation chapter 21, verse 2, and in Ephesians chapter 5. You are. God, Jesus, has, has made you spotless, has made you blameless, has made you beautiful as a bride adorned for her husband. And the culminating event of this will be when all of us get to be with God again forever in heaven. We talked about briefly this morning that the idea of, of what, what hell is going to be like, you know, fire and damnation and brimstone and, and, and all those, type, those types of things. We've already read that here in a couple of verses here. But, but the, the essence of what heaven is going to be is that you, as a Christian, have the opportunity to be with God forever, to dwell with Him eternally in this union, much like that of a husband and wife. Look at verses 3 and 4. Here's probably the verses that when you think about heaven and the things that you look forward to in heaven, some of the verses that you think about the most. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. And then verse 4, And he, God, will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And there will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. Maybe, maybe that's not a verse that you think about in, in, when you think about heaven, but that's one of the very first verses I think about. Uh, and, and David, this past Wednesday, he, he taught a class about uh, Revelation and, and talked about different interpretation styles and that sort of thing. And one of the things that he, of course, talked about was uh, the nature of figurative language and of um, the, the type of language that the Revelation is, uh, the type of literature that it is. So, so here, this is, this is clearly figurative language, right? Because there will be no tears in heaven, so how can he wipe them away? But it is figuratively, literally true. In heaven, there, there will be no need for tears. There will be no more sadness. There will be no more mourning. There will be no more loss. There will be joy. There will be 
happiness. There will be all of these things, again, because you and I get to be in the presence of God. One, one thing, just something as a side note before we get to our main point tonight. Uh, you're, the, you're the bride, Christians. And you're the tabernacle, Christians. You know what that means? You're going to have to put up with each other for eternity. So we might as well get used to it now, right? But we need, to, we need to learn how to love each other. And I think we do a great job here, but there's other folks that maybe are Christians, and, and we, need, we need to learn how to love each other. Because if we can't learn how to love each other here, we probably won't have the opportunity there. We've got to love each other. We've got to care about each other. We've got to be invested uh, in one another and do the things that are right. It's a beautiful picture in, in Revelation chapter 21, verses 3 and 4. But, but notice again, verse, chapter 20, verse 15, as we get closer to our point tonight. And if anyone's name was not found in the book of life... He was thrown into the lake of fire. Not everyone is going to get to go to heaven. Scripture teaches us that the, the way that leads to life is narrow. The path is difficult that leads to eternal life. And on the other hand, the, the path that leads to destruction, it's wide. It's easy. It, it's that, that seven or eight lane interstate uh, that everybody, as long as traffic's not bad, everybody can just zoom up and down as, as much as they want to. While on the other hand, the, the road to heaven is, is, is twisty and, and turning. You've got to go uphill and downhill. And it's, it's hard on your brakes sometimes. And it's hard on your engine to, to get up and go sometimes. It, sometimes it's, it's not always easy. But the destination, of course, is worth it. And then notice verse, chapter 21 and verse 8, the, the verse that we skipped earlier. But for the cowardly and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and immoral persons and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars, their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So in chapter 20, verse 15, if your name's not in the book of life, you don't go to heaven. In chapter 21 and verse 8, we see a few things that if, if this is who you are, you don't get to go to heaven. And, and we're not surprised, perhaps, by someone who would be described as abominable and murderers and immoral people and sorcerers and idolaters and liars. Their part will be in, in the lake of fire, the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, the second death. But did you notice the first two? It's not just people who are liars, and that, may, that one may surprise us from time to time. It's not just murderers. It's not just immoral people. It's all those who are cowardly and unbelieving. Know this beyond the shadow of doubt. You can be too afraid to go to heaven. If you are too afraid to live your life the way that you ought to live, you won't go to heaven. If you're too afraid, if, if whatever is holding you back to, from being who you know you're supposed to be being on your daily life, if you're too afraid to be who that, is, who that is, then you won't get to go to heaven. If you're cowardly, if you're unbelieving or unfaithful or don't have really the, the faith that it takes to be who God wants you to be. We see this pretty clearly, an example of this cowardly and unbelieving in Numbers chapter 13 and 14. I'm going to reference that. You know the story. Numbers 13 and 14 is the, the Israelites. They're at the promised land. They are there. God has brought them out of Egypt straight to the promised land. It was a quick trip, a few days. And God is prepared to take them into the promised land, it seems. And remember, they send the 12 spies in. Ten come back and say, it's a beautiful... Actually, all of them come back and say, the land is amazing. That I've never seen anything that good. It, it flows with milk and honey. It, it is just what God described that it is. But ten of them say, but the people that live there, there's no way we can, be, no way we can be, defeat them. No way that we, could, we can conquer this land. And of course, two say that they can. But because the Israelites are cowardly and unbelieving, they don't get to go to the promised land. And the same thing will be true of us. If, if we're too cowardly to do what God has called us to do, if we're too unfaithful, meaning that we don't have the faith that God will take care of us, then we won't get to go to heaven. What, what this means is, it's not always easy to be a Christian. Certainly, oftentimes, we have to get out of our comfort zone to be a Christian. And if we don't do that because of cowardice, because we don't believe that God will take care of us, then we're not going to go to heaven. Revelation 21 tells us that. 
I wanted to use this example on, on uh, Sunday morning. We're going to have a, uh, a Bible class for, for everybody in here, and it's going to uh, be about w some answers that you might give to questions when, when you're studying with people. But, but I had to use this example, and I've used Howard a whole lot lately, and I'm not building him up on a pedestal. You know, he needs one, but I'm not building him up on a pedestal. Uh, but but I, I do want to use it again. Uh, this Thursday, I think, I think it was Thursday, uh, we went visiting, and... Uh, we, we went two or three places, I think. We went to the hospital. We went to two places. We went to the hospital. We went to uh, Encompass Health, uh, Health South. Um, and this is Andy, the preacher, telling you this. I, I invited more people to church the one hour, literally, one hour that I was with Howard than I had probably the last month. And the reason for that is because Howard is, that's just who he is. Listen, I had to hold the door for the elevator because he stepped out of the elevator. Like we were on the elevator going up. It stopped at a floor. He was talking to somebody who was on it. They were trying to get away. He followed them out the door. We still had another floor to go, and there's somebody else in the elevator. Talk about comfort zone. I encourage you, go, go with Howard. You, you'll invite people to, he'll do it anyway, whether you do it or not. But you will be encouraged, to, you'll be yanked out of your comfort zone if you'll go with him. And guess what? I need to do that more. You probably need to do that more. And, and whether it's inviting people to church or having Bible studies with people or whatever it is, what is it that you are just too afraid to do? Revelation 21.8 says that if we don't do what we know we're supposed to do because of our fear, because of our cowardice, and in reality because we don't trust that God will take care of us when we do what He has told us to do, we won't go to heaven. We've all, we all know the things, most of us in here, know exactly what God expects of us, at least in broad strokes. But we've got to do it. I've got to do better. Maybe you need to do better. And not just because we want to check off a box and say, yeah, I invited somebody to church today, but because on Judgment Day, if God looks at us and says we're cowardly, and you didn't believe that I would take care of you, you don't get to go to heaven. Again, we, we think about that with murderers. Yeah, murderers who are unrepentant, they're not going to go to heaven. And immoral people and idolaters and, and all those other people, we, we fully understand that. But, but God says, the one who is speaking in Revelation 21 8, the one who sits upon the throne. And he said, if you're too cowardly, if you don't trust me, you won't go to heaven. So there are difficult things that we must do. And we must do them. And the only way we will do them is if we trust that God will take care of us. What does that mean? That means that, that we, may, we may know that if we do the right thing, it's going to end badly. But we're still going to do it because we trust that God will bring us through. We see a perfect example of that in Daniel chapter 3. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Our God can, our God will, but even if He doesn't, we will not bow down. And they went into the fire, and God took care of them. They, they were not cowardly. They were brave. They were not unbelieving. They had faith. They trusted that God would do exactly what He said, or at least that He could do exactly what He had promised. Now let's turn over to Matthew chapter 18. Excuse me, Matthew 18. So there's the, there's the general broad strokes of, of a message that this, this may turn into some sort of series. It, it may not. I don't really have a clue yet. But, but I think the, the idea, in my mind at least, of, of don't be too afraid to go to heaven, that, that's a pretty powerful idea in my mind. Don't be too afraid to go to heaven. Don't be too afraid to go to heaven. Don't be too afraid to evangelize to your friends. Because if you are, you won't go to heaven. Don't be too afraid to, uh, you know, obey this commandment or obey that commandment or do this or do that. Because if you don't, you're not going to go, going to, go to heaven. Don't, don't be so unbelieving and, and, and not trusting of God that you, you don't trust that He's going to take you through, through whatever dif difficulty comes your way. Uh, I think that's a, that's a powerful idea that Scripture gives to us. But in Matthew chapter 18, I want us to look at verses 15 uh, and, and following and consider this practically uh, today. And, and this is... This is one of those lessons, again, that, that I don't know, I don't know that anybody here has this issue. I wouldn't be surprised, okay? Uh, but, but I do know that in the church, there are people who have a problem obeying the commandment we read about in Matthew chapter 18. And, and I know that when they don't obey the commandment in Matthew chapter 18, people's lives have been ruined and people's souls have been lost. Don't be too afraid to obey the commandment we're about to read. It's not easy. It's not comfortable. It's not something you look forward to doing. But don't be too afraid to obey the commandment, because if you don't obey the commandment and you know you should, you're not going to go to heaven. Matthew 18, 15 through 17. If your brother sins, go and show him his fault in private. 
If he listens to you, you've won your brother. But if he does not listen to you, take one or two more with you, so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses every fact may be confirmed. If he re refuses to listen to them, tell it even to the church. And if he re refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a tax collector and a Gentile. Uh, th this idea of this is a passage that you could apply to church discipline, but that's not what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about you know that your brother or your sister is, is dealing with sin, is living in sin, is practicing sin. I'm not talking about we all fail, right? I can look at every single one of you and I can say, you failed lately, you failed lately, you failed lately, you've sinned lately. All of us have sinned at some point lately, more than likely. But if somebody is living in sin, we have a responsibility, an obligation, a duty, and a privilege to go to them and say, hey, I've noticed you've got this going on in your life. And we've got to get that fixed because I want you to go to heaven. And, and yeah, I've got problems in my life too, and I need you to help me with that. We're not going to with a holier-than-thou attitude or anything along those lines. But if we recognize they've got something in their life that they need to fix, then we... Notice, in Matthew 18, I don't believe he's talking to anybody in particular. I don't think it's just for the 12 apostles. He's just talking to people who are believers in him. Now, the Jews, he's talking to Jews, certainly, and they had, they had responsibilities to one another. This was something that was an, an expectation that God had for them, that you take care of your brother. But listen, God has an expectation for you to take care of your brothers and sisters in the church. God expects you to do this. And again, I, I don't know at all, I don't know at all that this is, is true of anyone here. I have no, you know, sometimes the elders ask me, sometimes after I preach lessons, what do you know that we don't know? I don't know anything that they don't know. I wouldn't be surprised, though, that, that you might be aware of some things that, that I'm not aware of within this family. And, and I'm aware of some things that you don't know, too, more than likely. But, but I know beyond the shadow of a doubt that, that in the church, there have been people who, let me, I'm not going to name names or anything because I don't want to do that. Uh, but I've, I've got a friend who uh, is a preacher, and there's some folks that think he's a false teacher. And you know what they haven't done? They haven't gone to him and talked to him about it. You know what they have done? Gossiped to other churches without talking to him at all. Can't do that. This is a young man, and it's just about ruined his life. <clears throat> Let that not be us. Don't be too afraid to go to heaven. If you know, or if you think, or if you think there's a possibility, or if you hear that somebody has sin in their life, don't gossip. Be brave enough to go to the person and ask them. And you know what will happen? You'll find out the truth. Is that convenient? Let's don't be, don't be too afraid to go to heaven. And, and, and in doing so... <clears throat> especially with this uh, command, hurt other people and really hurt the church uh, and, and certainly uh, not be pleasing to God. <clears throat> Excuse me, God. Uh, Matthew chapter 5. Let's, read, let's close in there. Matthew chapter 5. <clears throat> Gotta love when your voice squeaks. You're 35 years old. Uh, Matthew 25. Let's read verses 21 through... Uh, Matthew 5, 21 through uh, 24. Uh, here also talking about um, your relationship with your brother and how important this is, Okay. Matthew 5, 21 through 24. You have heard that the ancients were told you shall not commit murder, and whoever commits murder shall be liable to the court. But I say to you, whoever is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. And whoever says to his brother, you good for nothing, shall be guilty before the supreme court. And whoever says, you fool, shall be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. All right, now, if we just stop there, there's a lot of lessons there. Uh, You've got to think about how you, how you re re react to and uh, reference your brothers and sisters in Christ. Okay? Uh, again, there, there are things that, that we do that are foolish, but Jesus says, don't call anybody a fool. It's dangerous. Verse 23, Therefore, if you are presenting your offering at the altar, if you're worshiping God, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your offering there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and present your offering. As we think about this, don't be too afraid to go to heaven. Uh, two, two things that we talked about, Matthew 18 and Matthew 5. Matthew 18, if you hear that somebody is sinning, first of all, tell the person who told you, hey, have you talked to them about it? Because if you haven't, you're not following the Bible. 
Okay, remind them they're sinning if they're talking to you about it without talking to them about it first. And then you be brave enough and care enough about the brother or sister to go to them and say, Hey, I've heard this. I don't know if it's true or not, so I'm coming to you because I love you enough and I respect you enough and I respect God enough to obey the word and find out what the truth is. And then it says in Matthew chapter 5 that if you're in the middle of worship, why is this so important? Why is Matthew 18 so important? Because if you've got a problem with your brother or sister in Christ, it gets in the way of your worship of God. God says if you are in the middle of offering a sacrifice, now we don't do that today, right? No, we don't. Uh, but we think about that as a pretty formal thing, right? Offering a sacrifice, going up to the altar of God and bringing your offering and, and the, the priest being there and, and uh, slaying it and, and you know, made, made, laying it out on the, on the altar. We think of that as, that, yeah, that's pretty serious. I imagine when people went to the altar, they were in a pretty serious mind frame. They were in a pretty spiritual frame of mind. But God says, if you're in the middle of doing that, if you're next in line, or even if you're about to, to the priest is about to lay your offering on the, on the altar, leave. That would be like right now if you guys just got up and left. Okay? Something like that. Right in the middle of the, of the Lord's Supper, if you just got up and left. But, but the, the application is, if you've got a problem with your brother or sister in Christ and you haven't handled it yet, it gets in the way of your worship of God. And God would rather you not be here right now in the middle of worship and you go and fix your relationship with your brother or sister in Christ than you just going through the motions here because that's all you're doing if you haven't tried to fix your relationship with your brother or sister. Now, it's not your responsibility if what their, their response is, but it is your responsibility to go to them and do all you can to fix their relationship. Why? Circle all the way back to Revelation because you're going to spend eternity, or at least you want to spend eternity with that person. Brothers and sisters, I love you, and I want to spend eternity with you in heaven. And that means I've got to be brave enough to do the tough things, and so do you. If you're a Christian and you're not doing the tough things, let's do it. And let's be there together. Let's help each other on. And let's do those things that we have to get out of our comfort zone and the things that we really don't like. And there are those things for all of us. But let's get out of our comfort zone and let's, let's just be who God wants us to be. And if you're not a Christian this, this evening, you can be. Uh, if you're not a Christian tonight and, and you are of the right age and you know the difference between right and wrong and you've sinned, uh, you are currently destined to not go to heaven, and there's only one other choice. But you don't have to go to hell. You can become a Christian through faith, repentance, confession, and baptism into the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. You can begin that journey. It won't be easy. But your brothers and sisters, and maybe more, much more importantly, God will be there, and He'll bring you through it. If you need anything tonight, we encourage you. Please come as we stand and sing.